Next, the invaders in color. In 1967, Quinn Morton Productions was looking for a replacement for their top-rated series, The Fugitive, which was about to end its four-year run on ABC. Inspired by sci-fi films of the 50s, like Invasion of the Body Snatchers and Invaders from Mars, screenwriter, producer, and director Larry Cohen devised a series with a similar premise. Alien beings would take on a human appearance in an attempt to disguise themselves while they devised ways to take over the Earth. The main character, who discovered their insidious plans, would then be constantly on the move, trying to convince people about their existence. Although many thought Cohen took the theme about a man on the run from the Fugitive TV series, Cohen would later state that he based it on an Alfred Hitchcock formula where the hero is the only one who knew about a crime and no one believes him. When he finally takes the authorities back to the crime scene, everything is gone, and there's no evidence that anything had ever happened. Series creator Larry Cohen later acknowledged that the aliens were symbolic of communist infiltration left over from the McCarthy era in the 1950s when screenwriters were blacklisted for being associated with communist connections. Actor Roy Thinnes, who was chosen for the lead, had just come off a very successful run on the soap opera General Hospital. He was considered a fan favorite as he received a considerable amount of fan mail every day. That was enough to convince ABC that Thinnes was the right man for the job, so Quinn Martin Productions scooped him up at a reported bargain price of $7,500 per week to play architect David Vincent. Each show was to be announced as The Invaders in Color, as ABC was the last network to switch from black and white to full color programming. The aliens themselves had to regenerate their appearance on a regular basis in order to maintain their human form. To do this, they had to enter an energy tube that would charge them with a high dose of electricity. If they didn't regenerate in a certain amount of time, they would burn up, leaving a pile of ashes in their place. There were several ways that one could tell the aliens from a human being. First, they had no detectable heartbeat or pulse. Second, they didn't bleed. And third, some aliens also had a deformed little finger that would stick out at a weird angle. Most of the aliens were also emotionless, but a few showed some human emotions, and even some that were against the alien takeover. When the aliens died, they would glow red and disintegrate, so there was never any proof of their existence. And if they touched a piece of their technology while dying, it would also disintegrate. The invaders' weapon arsenal included a disc-shaped handheld object with five lights, which they would apply to the back of someone's head and cause instant death from a cerebral hemorrhage. They also had powerful weapons, which could disintegrate objects, vehicles, or witnesses that they wanted to silence. The first episode, entitled Beachhead, was written as an extended show, which featured all of the main elements that became standard in the regular series. The main character, David Vincent, would see one of the alien's UFOs landing in a field after he had fallen asleep on an old country road. When he convinces the local sheriff to investigate the next day, there is no trace of anything in the area. Vincent insists that he encountered aliens from another planet, and ends up in the local sanitarium. The deformed pinky finger makes its first appearance here, as well as a romantic interest of Vincent's, who may or may not be an alien. Spoiler, she is. We also see Vincent's partner and best friend, Alan Landers, show up, only to be killed by the aliens before Vincent can help him. Here, we see the first use of the aliens' regeneration machines, which also trigger heart attacks in humans. While Beachhead was initially filmed to air as a 90-minute pilot episode, it was cut down by the network to fit into its 60-minute time slot, which producer Alan Armour regretted. He had said that the pilot, in its original form, was the invader's finest and subtlest effort. The Museum of Modern Art screened the unedited version of Beachhead only once in 1969, but it has never been shown again not even on the VHS or DVD compilations that have since been released. The iconic flying saucer design used in the opening was taken from several famous UFO photos of the time. First, from a case in Santa Ana, California in 1965, where a highway traffic engineer took several photos of a strange flying craft, 
and also from the infamous George Adamski UFO case from December 13, 1952, also in California. The photos were then combined and the invader's UFO was born. Then it's played Vincent as distant and intense, characteristics that many on the set thought Thinnis himself displayed, but Roy took his role very seriously. He was so into the role that he began to actually believe that there were invaders. In fact, Thinnis told reporters that he had seen a UFO himself. It seems like a publicity stunt today, but according to producer Alan Almer, Thinnis was a believer and he believed in the series. It was actually upsetting to Thinnis when crew members would make fun of the concept and not take the subject of aliens very seriously. Thinnis and his producer actually attended UFO conventions and spoke directly with individuals who themselves claimed to have sightings or direct contact with spaceships and aliens. The Invaders pilot debuted as a mid-season replacement on ABC in January of 1967. Originally envisioned as having two half-hour episodes a week with a cliffhanger ending on the first show of the week, this idea was shelved as it was too similar to the new Batman formula. The show was deemed to be strong enough without a serial type of format. Although the first season's episodes were rushed into production due to the network's time constraints, there were several memorable episodes. The best of these was when the show delved into the horror aspects of the aliens. Unfortunately though, Many of the episodes became formulaic, with an anthology format that would focus more on the guest star of the week's problems than on the alien invasion itself. Also, most of the writers employed by Quinn Martin were unfamiliar with the whole genre. This made for some very mediocre episodes where the aliens took a back seat. They didn't realize at the time that the alien takeover was why people were tuning into the show in the first place. The Invaders debuted to above average ratings on January 10, 1967, and 17 episodes were produced for its first season. The ratings immediately started to fall off after that strong debut, but ABC had enough faith in Quentin Martin Productions to give the go-ahead for a second full season of 26 episodes. However, without a full grasp of the show's direction, season two debuted with several lackluster episodes, and ratings continued to fall. A shift in direction in the middle of the second season was a last desperate move to try and save the show. A group of so-called believers was introduced who would be there to help Vincent when needed and finance the fight against the aliens. Unfortunately, the change was not enough to save the series, and the last episode, Inquisition, aired on March 26, 1968. But that's not the end of the story. In 1995, an Invaders miniseries aired starring Scott Bakula as the new alien fighter. Roy Thinnis reprised his role as David Vincent in a small part, but the new series failed to take off. There have been talks on and off about a big screen reboot, but nothing has gone beyond that stage. The Invaders' take on alien invasion and paranoia helped to inspire the highly popular series The X-Files in the 1990s. In a nod to The Invaders, X-Files creator Chris Carter had Roy Thinnis guest star in three X-Files episodes as Jeremiah Smith, a mysterious healer who turns out to be an alien hybrid clone. While The Invaders was a TV premise perhaps ahead of its time, it's still indoors in reruns and DVD compilations. It may not have been the most popular show of its time, but it still holds up today as a leader in the alien takeover genre and inspiration to many TV series. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to my channel. I'm on my way to 100,000 subscribers, and I really do appreciate your support. What did you think of The Invaders? Did you think the show ended too soon? Did it veer off in the wrong direction at the end? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And as always, this is Rich from Rerun Zone, signing off.